Good morning. It's a blessing to be here with you this Sabbath day. It's always a blessing when the Sabbath comes, and a blessing to worship the Lord together. As I flew in yesterday into Phoenix, I was reminded, it was about 11 years ago, that I was in Tucson for two or three months doing an evangelistic series there. And uh, now this isn't like Tucson and Phoenix, I realize that, but Phoenix is kind of like Tucson. <laughs> so it reminded me, all the big sagueros everywhere and things like that, reminded me from when I was uh, here doing evangelism a while ago. And uh, then it so came up higher to the, I don't know, in California you'd call it the high desert. Do you, still, do you call, that, call it here the high desert or not? Yes? No? <laughs> well, in the higher elevations. <laughs> and uh, so nice to be here. And a little interesting, when I told some of, I can't remember who, I told one of the church members up in Washington, I said, well, they asked where I, where I was going to be. I said, well, I won't be at church this Sabbath. I'm going to be in Arizona. And it's been fairly hot for, uh, for Washington right now. It's been in the 80s, and low 80s. That's fairly hot for Washington. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to be in Arizona. He says, oh, you're going to go where it's really hot. <laughs> and uh, so it was hot in Phoenix, but then it was very comfortable uh, last night and this morning, and so not so warm. But it's a blessing to be together, a blessing that we can worship together, and a blessing that the Lord has in store for us as we're going to open his word together. And I'd like to turn for our opening text to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. There's a lot that could be studied from 1 Corinthians 10, and we're not going to study it in detail, but I want to use this verse somewhat as a springboard. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition." upon whom the ends of the world are come. Everything, now Paul has just given some specific details with the wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness during the 40 years there. But basically, as we look at this verse, it's teaching us that God has given to us everything in sacred history as an example for us today. And as we look at those examples, it's going to help us to understand our position and our lot today. And so he says, all of these things are happened for examples for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, what is an example? What was that? Okay, Lot's wife, there's lots of examples, but as, if we just think of, say, an example, if just in the natural world, just around us today, if someone gives us an example, what are they doing? They're showing us how to do it, aren't they? Now, is it a lot easier frequently to be shown how to do something or to just be told how to do something? <laughs> Normally, it's shown is a lot easier to comprehend, isn't it? And, uh, you know, it's when I'm, I do a little bit of building, I'm not a professional by any means, but when I do, do building, if I don't know what to do, what I do is I go look at somebody else, what somebody else has done, and get an example from what they've done, and then that gives me an idea of what I can do in my project, whatever that might be. And uh, as I look at that example, and me, sometimes I have to go and look at a lot of examples before I can get it figured out. We look and see at an example, at something that has been done. Same thing that you would do when we have cooking schools and things like that. Why do we have a cooking school? We don't just hand them out recipes and say, okay, go make it, do we? We show them how to do it. We let them taste what it tastes like. And by seeing how it's done and by tasting it, people become a lot more receptive or a lot more apt to actually go and to do it rather than if they just get something in the mail or something like that. Examples are very beneficial for us. And uh, the uh, series that I want to be looking at today is based on examples. 
and I've called it Templates for Today. Now, a template is basically just like an example, something that you follow, and it will, you will achieve the desired end product. Templates for today. And I'd actually like to look at three individuals that I believe, or that we know that God has told us are examples for us today in our time. And there's different aspects and different character traits and abilities that each of these individuals that they're examples about. And I'd like to look, first of all, at a man that very little in the Bible is said about him. But what is said definitely counts. He's a man that he actually is the one, he is the first Adventist in the Bible. He gave us the first sermon that we have on record in the Bible. Now, I'm sure there were other sermons that were preached, but the first sermon that is actually documented was preached by this man. And the subject of his sermon was Jesus coming. I find that very interesting because this man lived before the flood. <laughs> Who is it that I'm talking about here? Enoch. Enoch lived 4,000 years ago, over 4,000 years ago. He lived before the flood. He lived before Jesus came the first time. And the sermon material that we have that he gave is preaching about the second coming. Has the second coming been present truth for a long time? <laughs> you know, it's not just for our time. Now, it's especially for our time, but it is not just for our time. Because here, Enoch, 4,500 years ago or more, preached about the second coming. And it's the first recorded sermon that we have in the Bible. Let's just read it. Jude, verse 14 and 15. The first recorded sermon in the Bible is, the second, is in the second to the last book of the Bible. <laughs> Jude, verses 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch, the seventh for Adam. And what is the thrust of his sermon here? We have a sound bite, a transcript, a tiny sound bite from his sermon. Okay, the coming of Jesus and his judgment. He says, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment. And then he's saying, the, he's using this as a motivation for obedience, for right living. But let's go back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. There are only three places in the Bible where Enoch is mentioned. We've just read one. We're going to read the second, and the last is in Genesis. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he, what does it say he did? Pleased God. Is that a testimony that you would like to have? <laughs> Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. God. And it says God translated him that he should not see death. Now when 
Jesus comes again, are there going to be a group of people that are translated without seeing death? And this group of people, are they going to need to have the experience that Enoch had? In order to have that experience, in order to have the same experience that Enoch had of not passing under death, of being alive when Jesus comes, God's people are going to have to have the experience that Enoch had. They're going to have to study his example. And while there's not very much recorded in the Bible, what is recorded is an example for us because God is calling us to be like Enoch today. So what was Enoch like? How did Enoch have the testimony that he pleased God? Clearly it says he had this testimony, that he pleased God. How did Enoch have this testimony? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 5. Enoch chapter 5, not Enoch, sorry, Genesis 5, 21 and 22. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, and he begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. The prominent feature of Enoch is the phrase we just read there in verse 22. It says, and Enoch did what? Walked with God. And there were various ways that Enoch walked with God. But it's interesting, when Enoch begins walking with God, when does it say he begins walking with God, or that at least it begins in a prominent way? After his first son, after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. Now, Methuselah, there's been lots of discussion about Methuselah's name in particular and about Methuselah himself. Methuselah, of course, is known because why? (laughs) He's the longest-lived man in the Bible that we know of, right? The longest-lived man in the Bible that that died, uh, 969 years. But there's been discussion about actually the name of Methuselah Because while Methuselah was Enoch's son, he lived 969 years. When you compute it out, about where does it bring you to? Do you remember? Do you know? When you figure out mathematically, Methuselah must have died right about when the flood was coming. So right in the same year, some have suggested even within the same week or two, that the flood was coming, Methuselah died. Now, some people have taken this and they've looked at Methuselah's name and they indicate that it means when he dies, it will come. Or the, and it's, it's kind of ambiguous. It's hard to say that exactly. Uh, but the idea that is conveyed is that Enoch knew that a flood was coming. And while Enoch knew that a flood was coming, he prophesied of the flood through the naming of his son. Now, when you look it up, Methuselah in a Strong's Concordance, it's going to say man of dart. And it's, like I said, it's it's not quite certain exactly what it means. But what we do know for sure is that Enoch knew that a flood was coming. And that Enoch told others, including his son, and presumably his son told his grandson, Noah, and then God at some point communicated directly with Noah as well. But if Enoch knew that a flood was coming and he was warning, he was telling others about that, does he have a heart for outreach? (laughs) Absolutely he does. He is warning of a flood coming actually 900 years before it comes. He's warning of a flood that is coming. Now, we also know, we read in James... 
And in, not James, I'm sorry, the book of Jude. And in Jude, Enoch is preaching. And who does it say Enoch is preaching to? Do we go back and look at that? It says four times actually about it in Jude verses, verses uh, 19 and 14 and 15. Jude 14 and 15 says, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are, what does it say? Ungodly, right? To convince all that are ungodly among them of all their, what does it say? ungodly deeds, which they have, what does it say? <laughs> ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches, which, what does it say again? Ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Who is Enoch preaching to? <laughs> the ungodly, isn't it? <laughs> Four times in verse 15, it mentions the ungodly. He's warning the ungodly because of their ungodly deeds, their ungodly speeches of ungodly sinners. He is warning not the descendants of Seth, per se, not those that know, although probably he had communicated with them also, but he is speaking to those that are rebelling. Now, in Enoch's day, we have the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain. What did Cain do when he was rebuked? Okay. Would, would Cain be somebody you would like to rebuke? Looks, I mean, just from the character that we have a description of, Abel pleads with him, and Cain does what to him? He strikes him and kills him, doesn't he? Cain did not like being rebuked. Now, that did not stop him. Stop Abel from rebuking him. But Cain was such that Cain did not, not only did he not like it, but he slew the man that rebuked him. Sometimes we're afraid to go knock on a door because they think they're going to slam the door in our face, right? <laughs> That's nothing compared to what Cain did, is it? And Enoch is going to the descendants of Cain. And by the way, we also see in the lineage of Cain that Cain has murders in his lineage as well. Enoch is going and he is preaching not to those that enjoy his message, but Enoch is going and preaching to the ungodly, to the sinners, to those that are committing all these ungodly deeds. Enoch is endangering his life to go give a message from the God of heaven. I would say, as we look at that, as we think about that, that Enoch walked with God in outreach. Enoch did not just go away to some secluded place and enjoy communion with God by himself. Enoch did do that at times. But Enoch went to where the most hardened sinners were and he warned them because he loved them and he wanted them to have the experience that God had given to him. Enoch had a burden for the lost souls around him. Enoch walked with God by going and sharing with others. Enoch is an example for us. Do we need to have the burden for others that Enoch had? You know, I've never been in a situation that I know of, at least, where someone has threatened to kill me for preaching a message. Now, in the Philippines, when you preach about the mark of the beast, there are people that will start throwing rocks and things like that. And uh, 
I get kind of oblivious sometimes that I'm preaching and publicly about it, but I've, I've been told that there were some that were throwing rocks. I was, at one point time, I was preaching in El Salvador, and we were in a public park, and uh, we were uh, preaching on the Mark of the Beast again, uh, not the first night, but way near the end, and right next to this public park was the big Catholic church in the middle of town. And uh, so uh, we were preaching there, and uh, there's soldiers all around, and in a lot of these countries, the soldiers are what you fear the most. And uh, as we were preaching, I noticed, now I didn't see this, but my translator said he saw this, someone come out in a white robe and talk to one of the soldiers. But what I did see was that the soldier came up to us as we were preaching and was very angry and unhappy and was, the people were trying to calm him down or whatever. I don't know what he was saying. First of all, I wouldn't have understood it even if I would. Second of all, I was just going forward and preaching. But you know, those are just little things. Enoch was going to where he knew he could lose his life just like Abel did. But Enoch went anyway with a message from God. Enoch did not fear their faces. You know, when the Lord called Jeremiah, he said, don't fear their faces. He said, I'll make your faces an adamant stone. Don't fear their faces. And Enoch had that experience. And Enoch is an example for us that God is calling us to go and to warn and to give a message. Enoch, in his preparation for being translated, was not just at home praying. He was praying, no doubt about it. But Enoch was doing more than that. He was going and doing the work that God had given him to do. There's a couple statements that I find interesting regarding Enoch and the work that he was doing. This is from, it's a newer devotional book, Christ Triumphant, page 48. But Enoch was terribly in earnest. He did not idly saunter along the streets or linger near places of amusement as if he were an indifferent worldling. He never engaged in common conversation with those who were corrupt, as if he were one of them. With the sinful and with the workers of iniquity, he mingled only as God's messenger to warn them to turn with abhorrence from their evil ways and to repent and seek God. I found that interesting, that he did not mingle with them as one of them. So I read that. I thought of a character in the Bible. When Peter denied Jesus, what was the root problem? He was mingling with them as one of them, wasn't he? He was there gathered around the fire, warming himself, and he was trying to fit in with them. And when he was asked questions because he was trying to fit in with them, because he was mingling to be one of them, he denied Jesus. Whereas John was right there, but nobody even had to ask John whether he was a follower of Jesus because they all knew because he wasn't joining in them. He wasn't laughing and jesting with them. He was watching the proceedings of the trial. Enoch did not mingle with them as one of them, but he mingled with them as a messenger from God with a message for them. Even though he was mocked, how do we like being mocked? Is that something that we enjoy? <laughs> you know, our, we rise, our flesh rises up against that, doesn't it? We do not like to be disliked by peers or even anyone. But Enoch was mocked because he had a message from God, and he was giving that message. I think we need to be braver in giving the message that God has given to us. Enoch's life was devoted to giving a message from God. How many people were accepted Enoch's message? Not very many. We don't know. Noah 
gave a message for 120 years. How many accepted Noah's message? Just his family. Was it worth 120 years of preaching? It was worth it, wasn't it? But there were very few that accepted. Noah preached for 120 years. He had, as far as we know, the longest evangelistic series on record, 120 years. The longest Adventist evangelistic series was in the, I think it was 30s or 40s. It was in California. Ten years that they were, it was, it was not every night for ten years, but at least once a week for ten years uh, they were holding an evangelistic series. But Noah's beats that by a lot. 120 years. But Enoch, how long was he preaching? At least 300 years. And as Enoch preached for at least 300 years, there were some, no doubt, that accepted the message. We don't know. But were there many then that stayed with it all the way and got on the ark? No. Enoch did the work that God gave him to do, even though there appeared to be no results. Do we have a work to do even if it doesn't, even if we can't see tangible results, do we still have a work to do? We have a work to do because God has called us to do that work. And that work is helping us to prepare for translation ourselves. Let's go ahead and look back in Genesis 5. Number one, Enoch walked with God by sharing with others. If we're going to learn from Enoch's example, we need to walk with God by sharing with others. Enoch's life was devoted to sharing with others. Our need, ours needs to be as well. Verse 22, and Enoch, what does it say? Walked with God after he begat the Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Now, what does that phrase, walked with God, what does that mean? Obey. Okay, he obeyed him. Let's look at that, Genesis 6. Because Noah walked with God also. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah, what does it say? Walked with God. Perfect man, just in his generations, and he walked with God. What was Noah's walk with God? Notice verse 22. By the way, verse uh, where is it here? Verse 8 is where it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Have you ever met somebody that says, well, grace is something that came in in the New Testament? Yes. Did grace come in in the New Testament or did Noah find grace? Noah found grace. Grace is a human, is something that God has given to humanity from Adam and Eve all the way to the last person that's alive today. Grace is not just a New Testament invention. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And notice, and have you ever, as you talk with people, say, well, grace is only in the New Testament. When people talk about grace, what is the concept that they frequently are meaning? Well, I'm under grace, so I don't need to obey the law. Isn't that what a lot of them are saying when they're talking about grace? I'm under grace, so obedience isn't important anymore. But Noah, was Noah under grace? Yes, he was, because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was under grace, and notice what Noah did. Verse 22. Thus did Noah according to how much? All that God commanded him, so did he. Noah was under grace, but what did he do? He did all that God had commanded him, didn't he? We're to be under grace and to do all that God has commanded us to, aren't we? Grace 
and obedience are partners, not mutually exclusive. But Noah walked with God. And Noah's walk with God was such that the Bible says he did all that God commanded him to do. Did God ask him to do a lot? First of all, we already mentioned, the New Testament says that Noah was a preacher. Would that be a hard job to preach for 120 years with no converts? Do we like, does it encourage us when we see results from our efforts? That's encouraging to us. And, it's, and it's, God desires us to see results. I'm not saying he doesn't. But Noah was given a job to go preach for 120 years and either all that accepted, those that did accept, either died or backslid before the flood came. What else did God command Noah to do? Build an ark, right? Was that a big job? Patriarchs and Prophets mentions that even in their superior strength and wisdom, the trees were almost like rocks. That it was difficult for them. This was not soft wood they were working with. We had a neighbor in my, where my parents live in Iowa, and uh, Iowa doesn't have a lot of soft wood, but when they built their house, Iowa doesn't have a lot of wood, but where, when they built their house, they cut down some of the trees in their property and had them milled up. And they happened to be oak. And uh, oak is very hard. And uh, what she, she was talking to us, she said, you know, when we were doing that, we better get those nails in when it was still green. Otherwise, it was going to be really hard to get those nails in. And I can imagine it was a situation like that with Noah building the ark. It was such a big task that it took 120 years to do. Four hundred and fifty feet long or something like that. Enormous. And did God give the specific directions to Noah? He did. How many doors did God direct to be put in this ark? One. How many windows? One. One window, one door. Now, imagine thinking about this as you're building. Noah's building. And as he's building, he's looking over the plans that he has, and there's one door and there's one window. Would that fit building codes today? Not at all. They'd close the church down if this church only had probably one door in it. <laughs> or make them put another door or something. I don't know exactly what they'd do. And uh, that door was going to be shut. Now, I don't know the exact design. I'm sure that God had everything figured out, and I'm sure it wasn't a problem. But humanly speaking, if you were going to be in this boat with four a long time, over a year, with all of these animals and all of their food and all of this, would you think some ventilation might be a good thing? Now, I'm sure that God had everything figured out, but from a human perspective, one window doesn't seem like it would provide enough ventilation. What if Noah would have said... You know, this is a really good plan. The hole is designed perfectly. And the deck and everything, all of that's great. 
But we really need a little bit more ventilation because we're going to be in here on a long time with a lot of animals, and I don't know that we can endure this unless we have more ventilation. So let's put another window or two in here. What do you suppose the result would have been if Noah would have said that? No matter how well the hole had been constructed, no matter how well everything else had been built, because it was not according to the plans that God had given, that boat would have sunk. Because God could not protect disobedience. Even with the perfect design that God gave of that, to that boat, it required angelic protection through the entire storm. If Noah would have altered the plan even by the slightest bit, God would not have been able to protect him through that flood. But Noah didn't do that. Noah walked with God. Noah did all that God had commanded him. Enoch walked with God. Thus Enoch did all that God commanded him. Do we need to do all that God commands us today? It's very easy for us to start rationalizing things away. To start coming up with reasons why this doesn't fit for us or why we're different or whatever it might be. The devil is in the business of giving excuses. But those that learn from the example, the template that Enoch gives are going to walk with God in not partial obedience, but they are going to walk with God in complete obedience. Let's look at another aspect of this. Let's go to Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. Verse 3, we know this verse. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Who was Enoch walking with? God. Does that mean then that if he was walking with God, that Enoch and God were in agreement they were in constant agreement. Not because God changed his opinions, but because Enoch changed his. He walked in agreement with God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 5. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah says, pleads to his people, O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What does it mean to walk in the light of the Lord? Obey. If we're walking in the light of the Lord, thy word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. God's light is his truth that he reveals to us. 
And Isaiah says, let us walk in the light, in the truth that God has revealed to us. Let us go walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in obedience to the Lord. We need to keep pace walking with the light that God reveals to us. You know, you can't walk together unless you're walking at the same pace, can you? When I'm in Congo, I was there earlier this year. Congo is another world on, on the planet Earth, but still another world. And uh, when you go there, it's hard to comprehend not having anything that we're used to. And uh, when you, when we go out to the bush area, there's all of these, and there's, the Lord is opening the door, there's, hun I mean, hundreds of villages that are calling for the Adventist message to be received in them. And uh, there's all these workers that are going over, and it began like seven years ago or something like that, with one brother that went back to where he was from and began sharing the message there. Now there's 50 churches there <laughs> in an area where there's never been uh, the Adventist message before. From one brother sharing, the, some accepting. Now he had been a Baptist pastor in that same area, so he did have some contacts. But as he was sharing, others accepted, they began to share, and it's grown uh, exponentially. But as you're out there, there's dozens of villages that want you to visit them, and there's no way to get to those villages except on foot. And uh, there's not roads, there's not cars, there's not taxis, there's nothing like that that you can take. You have to walk to get there. And so we end up walking a long, long way. And as we're walking, and we can have sometimes, because we're going, the Bible workers and various people, people are coming with food and helping to cook, and we can have a troop of 20, 30 people that are walking. But as there's 20 or 30 people that are walking, we can be spread out for a mile. <laughs> And uh, there's all these little groups that are walking together, and some are walking faster, some are walking slower, some are taking more rest, some are just going, wanting to get there, and uh, just spread out over a long distance. Now, as you're walking, you're really not walking together with the people that are way ahead of you or way behind you, are you? <laughs> there's only a few that you may be walking with. But Enoch walked with God. Enoch was not way behind God, waiting, trying to catch up to God. Nor was Enoch way ahead of God, from humanly speaking. Enoch was keeping pace with God. As God set the pace, Enoch kept up. Enoch was walking with God in obedience as God revealed and led the way. I'm going to look at just another interesting verse on walking. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be, what does it say? Wise. wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Do your associations have an influence upon you? Are we walking with wise men? Those that walk with the wise are going to become wise, it says. There's going to be, you're going to be influenced by those that you are in association with. As Enoch walked with God, 
He was influenced by the character of God. Could there be anyone wiser to walk with than God? <laughs> and as Enoch walked with God, Enoch became wise by walking with God, by association, by communion with God, by obedience to God. Does God still call us to walk with him today? We walk with him by sharing, in sharing with others. We walk with him in obedience. There are several interesting statements that we're told. Let's see if I can find a couple here. Same book, Christ Triumphant, 54. It was in looking in faith to Jesus, in asking of him, in believing that every word spoken would be verified, that Enoch walked with God. He kept close by the side of God, obeying his every word. Same book, page 64. A person who truly loves and fears God Striving with singleness of purpose to do his will. What is singleness of purpose? If you have a singleness of purpose, you have how many purposes? One. One, One purpose with singleness of purpose to do his will. We'll place body, mind, heart, soul, and strength under service with God. He clept close by the side of God, obeying his every... Whoops, I, miss, I missed up there. I jumped up. Those who are determined to make the will of God their own must serve and please God in everything. You know, when you look around us in the world today... Is there a lot of wickedness around us? You know, you can see wickedness, hear about wickedness. The news is full of wickedness. It's wickedness all around us, isn't it? And sometimes we think that the world has never been this bad before, right? Notice what we're told about Enoch. Speaking of Enoch, his piety, his purity, his unswerving integrity were the result of his walking with God, while the wickedness of the world was the result of their walking with the deceiver of mankind. There never has been and never will be an age when the moral darkness will be so dense as when, as when Enoch lived a life of irreproachable righteousness. Was the world wickeder in Enoch's day than our day? That's what it says. Sometimes we have a hard time believing that, but that's what it says. There never has been, nor will there ever be, a time when the moral darkness is so dense as it was not in Enoch's day. If there never has been and there never will be a time when the moral darkness has been so dense as in Enoch's day, does that mean we can walk with God today? Amen. Does that mean we have an excuse? No excuse. Enoch walked with God in the darkest, densest, in terms of morality, period of this earth's history. And Enoch walked with God, and we don't have anything negative spoken of against Enoch, do we? Now, Enoch fell short of the glory of God. Enoch sinned. We know that because all have sinned. But Enoch is not somebody like David that God used but then made terrible mistakes. God gave us an example of someone who walked with him in obedience, in witnessing in all of these areas, 
in the worst period of this earth's history so that it would be a testimony, a proof that whenever we live, wherever we live, we can walk with God too. And how long did Enoch walk with God? 300 years. Is that a long time? What was this world like 300 years ago? America did not exist, did it? There was no electricity. No running water. I mean, there could have been gravity fed, but... The world was totally different. There were no airplanes. There were no cars. The fastest way to get somewhere was by a horse. Amazingly different. We can hardly think of what it was like 300 years ago. 1710. I don't believe George Washington was even born yet in 1710. And Enoch walked with God for 300 years. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to, when something big happens, oh, this is good, the prophecies are going to be fulfilled now, we need to get ready. And that's true, we need to get ready. And then we're feeling that way for a little while, and then as time goes on, what happens? Well, things didn't happen the way we thought they were, so it's, and it's not right, and we shouldn't, but it's easy to kind of relax a little, right? We should not need some exciting development to prop us up. Enoch was not dependent upon exciting developments. Enoch walked with God not for five years, ten years, twenty years, for three hundred years. Three times probably the maximum lifetime we would achieve in this world. Enoch walked with God. It didn't matter to him that the image of the beast wasn't being formed yet. It didn't matter to him that there was no Sunday law or whatever. You plug it in, something in. Enoch walked with God because he loved God. That was his motivation. It wasn't because this was fulfilling and this was happening or something else. Enoch walked with God because he knew that that was the best way to walk. We live in a time when prophecies are fulfilling. We live in a time that is much closer to the second coming than Enoch's time by far. But we should not be dependent upon fulfilling prophecy or excitement or things like that to have an experience of preparation for translation. Enoch had an experience of preparation for translation every day for 300 years. And most significantly, when you're walking with somebody, generally you're in communication with them, aren't you? It might not be non-stop talking, but you're still in communication with them. When you're riding with somebody in the car, you might not be talking the whole time, but if you see something interesting, you might, oh, you might turn over and talk to the person, right? Or if something comes to your mind, or whatever. You're in communication with the one that you're walking with or that you're next to. Was Enoch in communication with God? 
Did Enoch still have his work to do? Sure. I don't know what Enoch's occupation exactly was. Probably he was involved in agriculture. It's very likely that he had to think about when he was going to plant and do various things with his job. He had to think about those things. But in everything, Enoch was in communion with God. He knew that God was right beside him and he would naturally communicate with his God. Patriarchs and Prophets says, I believe it's Patriarchs and Prophets, says Enoch walked with God as a husband, as a father, as a friend, and as a citizen. Four things. If he was a husband, that means he had, he was being faithful in his home. He was performing, doing, helping in the house, doing whatever. A father. A friend. He was faithful to his associates as a friend. A citizen. Even with whatever societal organization they had at that point in time, Enoch was faithful as a citizen as well. Walking with God does not mean praying 100% of the time. But it means being in communion and always recognizing that God is right there with us. Read a couple statements here. And how did Enoch walk with God? He educated his mind and a heart to ever feel that he was in the presence of God. And when in perplexity, his prayers would ascend to God to keep him. He refused to take any course that would offend his God. He kept the Lord continually before him. He would pray, teach me thy way, that I may not err. What is thy pleasure concerning me? What shall I do to honor thee, my God? He educated his mind to ever feel that he was in the presence of God. Can we do that today? Do we need to? We need to recognize that whether we are swinging a hammer, washing the dishes, working in the garden, bent over a desk, that we are in the presence of God. And that whenever something arises, we can simply ask our helper there. says, he, that is Enoch, was of one mind with God. One mind with God. Testimonies, volume 6, page 393. Many fail of imitating our holy pattern because they study so little the de definitive or the definite features of his character. So many are full of busy plans, always active. And there is no pl time or place for the precious Jesus to be a close, dear companion. They do not refer every thought and action to him, inquiring, is this the way of the Lord? If they did, they would walk with God as did Enoch. You know, I think being busy is a good thing, but being too busy is not. Being active is a good thing, but being so active that we forget about referring every thought and action to Jesus as our companion is not a good thing. We should refer every thought and action to him saying, is this the way of the Lord? Testimonies, Volume 8, page 329. The infinite, unfathomable love of God through Christ became the subject of his meditations day 
and night. What was Enoch thinking about? The infinite, unfathomable love of God through Christ. What are we thinking about? You know, we need to ask ourselves that throughout the day. What do we think about when we're doing our mundane tasks? Enoch walked with God by thinking of the infinite, unfathomable love of God through Christ. And Enoch is an example for us today. Those that are translated as Enoch was, without seeing death, are going to be those that have educated their mind to dwell upon the love of God through Christ. Not always to have mental stimulation. Radio on, listening to the news, whatever, something else. But comprehending, thinking about the infinite, unfathomable love of God through Christ. She says, His faith waxed stronger, His love became more ardent with the lapse of centuries. And then she concludes this section by saying, to such communion, God is calling us. As was Enoch's must be their holiness of character, who shall be redeemed from among men at the Lord's second coming. As was Enoch's character, so ours must be. Template for today. Enoch walked with God by sharing with others. Enoch walked with God in obedience. Enoch walked with God in communion with God. And God is calling us to a generation of Enoch's today. Because as Enoch walked with God, eventually after 300 years, Enoch's walk with God was so close that God said, you know, he's walking with me so much. I'm just going to open the doors of heaven and he's going to walk right into heaven with me. It wasn't a gigantic leap for Enoch. He had been walking with God all through his life. And now he just took another step, as it were, and communed with God face to face. Why could he do that? Because he had been communing with God faith to faith for 300 years. And so it was no, nothing for him. It was no problem for him to then change from faith to face to face. Let's go back to Hebrews 11, verse 5. We read this to begin with. Templates for today. The communion with God of Enoch. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What testimony do we have? Those that are alive when Jesus comes are going to have the same testimony that Enoch had. They're going to have the testimony that they please God. Why? Because they're going to have the experience that Enoch had. May the Lord give us that grace. May we walk with God as Enoch did. May we learn day by day not to be content with just 
a little communion with God. But may we learn to walk with Him moment by moment, hour by hour. That our love may grow deeper. That we may be used more broadly. And that very soon when Jesus comes, we can meet not only our Savior face to face, but Enoch face to face as well. Let us kneel in prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank you for the example of Enoch. We thank you for the promise of a man who lived in the most darkest period of this earth's history, but who walked with you as such an example for us. As he walked daily with you in communion with you, we pray that we may have that daily walk, that daily communion with you. We pray that we may walk with you as Enoch did. And may we very soon walk with you in the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.